screen. Um, that said, I'd like to welcome to Politics and Prose Live, Mary Gordon. Um, her novel, Payback, is a novel of lifelong reckoning between two women. Unbeknownst to her many fans, Quinn Archer, the revenge-loving queen of the reality TV show Payback, was once an angry teen named Heidi. Her true story is only to Agnes, who was her art teacher at a private New England girls' school in the 1970s. Agnes saw a spark of originality in the brooding Heidi, but when she suggests Heidi visit the Museum of Modern Art in New York, the girl returns with a disastrous account of having been picked up at the museum by an older man. Agnes' stunned response will haunt both of the women for decades. Mary Gordon narrates this tale of hashtag Me Too misunderstanding from a time before there was language to contain it. She carries us through Heidi's disappearance and reinvention as Quinn and Agnes's escape into career and family in Italy until inevitably they meet again. A remarkable book about the precise weight of our words and deeds from a writer whose moral vision is deeply rewarding in its subtlety. Mary Gordon is the author of nine novels, including There Your Heart Lies, Final Payments, Pearl, and Love of My Youth, six works of nonfiction, including the memoirs, The Shadow Man and Circling My Mother, and three collections of short fiction, including the stories of Mary Gordon, which was awarded the Story Prize. She teaches at Bernard College, and tonight Mary will be in conversation with Meg Wolitzer. Meg is the author of The Female Persuasion, The Interestings, The Ten-Year Nap, The Position, and The Wife. She was guest editor of the Best American Short Series 2017 and had short fiction appear in McSweeney's, Flow Shares, The Pushcart Prize, and The Best American Short Stories. She has taught at the Iowa Writers Workshop, Skidmore College, and at the 92nd Street Y, and along with singer-songwriter Susie Roche, was a guest artist in the Princeton and Teller at Princeton University. She is currently on the faculty of the MFA program at Stony Brook, Southampton, where she co-directs bookends. Uh, without further ado, Mary Gordon and Meg Willis. Hi, everybody. Hi. Hi, Mary. I'm so excited to do this. Um, this is really a total treat. I love your book so much, and I'm really glad that uh, we get to talk about it. But before we get into anything, um, how about if you read a little bit from it? A little, give us a little amuse-bouche. Uh, but I will say, the book is part social satire, um, an exploration of the Me Too movement uh, and uh, female friendships and so much more. Which kind of section are you going to give us to start? Well, I'm just, I'm going to read from the beginning and the end, which are the kind of social satire parts, mm -hmm. because um, Quinn Archer, who was formerly Heidi Stoltz, is the star of a reality TV show called Payback. And I had a lot of fun um, kind of satirizing the kind of people who watch reality TV and reality TV itself. So this is the very beginning of the novel. The show is a local cable show in a town that I made up called Brimston, Arizona. And this is how we begin. This is the year 2018. The Arizona sun is strong this February afternoon, but all the women are quite cool and comfortable. You might think that they chose the colors of their shorts and sleeveless tops to match the colors of the fruits they're eating, cantaloupe, watermelon, honeydew. Their fingernails or toenails are painted in various shades of opalescence, silver, rose, robin's egg, blue. This is their weekly ritual, water aerobics, a manicure, a pedicure, then lunch, raw fruits, raw vegetables, whey protein and rinse smoothies in front of one of their wall-sized TVs. Their children are grown, their husbands are somewhere. They're waiting for the show that is their favorite and for which they feel a proprietary pride because it started as a local cable show here in their own Brimston and has now gone national, but they knew it when. I just love her, I always have. I'm crazy about everything about her. When she goes after someone, I just feel good about things, like the world's on the right track, 
blah, 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 and boo hoo hoo, they say, imitating Quinn's inflection, toasting each other with their pastel smoothies. Um, and um, then I'm going to read the end, which is what happens after Agnes has been a guest on Payback, guest, so to speak. The women meet for lunch after hot yoga at Brimston's newest restaurant, Slow Co Loso, named for its principles, slow cooked, locally sourced. They feel fortunate to have gotten a table knowing that they needed to reserve a week in advance. The menu provides two choices, each accompanied by a narrative. Cauliflower nest, poached egg from our very own hens living behind the restaurant, the gifts of Polly and Molly, our star layers. In a nest of cauliflower grown down the road at one of our dear providers, Willow Moonstone, organic farmer or extraordinaire and star of Valerie Singleton's morning circle. Our vegan option, celeriac soup, lovingly slow cooked by our own Tracy Windsor, a, grown a quarter mile down the road by our treasured Mike and Sissy Lloyd. Rumor has it that the avocados they are growing in their greenhouse will be available within a month or two. The women do not walk, balk at the price of each entree, $24. They call this splurge day, and they know that they deserve it. They have been good wives, good mothers, and they fear the day later than they hope rather than sooner when their husbands retire. They have been warned, quote, might be some belt tightening, unquote, but there will be no belt tightening, rather belt loosening, if they have to cut their classes at the gym and can no longer lunch at places like Slow Coloso, which tend to be pricey. It's great to see that Willow's Farm is working out, one of the women says, and that she and Valerie and Allison are still with it. I can't believe that playback, payback's being canceled. You could see it coming. She was losing her edge. It's the same thing all the time, money and sex, money and sex. And then she blew it all with the teacher. I mean, she was a nice person. And, you know, she really had to stop wearing those sleeveless sheaths. I mean, maybe you can't be too thin or too rich, but those arms were really looking ropey. I wonder what they're going to replace her with. There was some talk of the Real Housewives of Phoenix, but I don't think it went anywhere. Yeah, well, whatever it is, it damn well better be inter entertaining. And that's the way the book ends. That is such a great excerpt. I have to say, if, I had, if you gave me a million topics and said, what would Mary Gordon write about? I don't think I ever would have imagined you would write a book that has a reality TV host at its center. How did that come about? Well, it came about in two ways. First of all, because we have a reality TV host for our president. And, and this is really a, a Trump era book. Um, what and year did you start writing? When did you start writing it? I started writing it in the end of 2017. Right. Um, so the beginning of 2018. Um, and I just, as I assume many of us have been, have been so upset about the, the brutality, the the vulgarity, the uh, the uh, the lying, and the assumption that reality TV is reality. And I remember having lunch with a friend of mine's daughter, who was a perfectly nice young woman, and she said, "I don't read fiction because it's so much less believable than reality TV." So and I thought, wow, they really, they really think reality TV is reality and that fiction is not reality. And for me, fiction was always dug beneath the surface of whatever reality is to show us the depth so we can see the full scope of a reality. And then the other um, thing that I was thinking about is I read something about Trump by a psychiatrist who said that he felt that his mother never, probably his mother never looked at him enough. And when she looked at him, it wasn't with love and pleasure. And so he can never, ever be looked at enough. Um, and so those were the kinds of things I was thinking about. I'm also really fascinated by revenge 
which I also think is so much in the air nowadays, um, revenge, that is, it seems to me an appetite that can never ever be satisfied. Um, and uh, so, so I think those, those were the things be, that caused me to write this book because we are living in an extraordinary time. And, and in a way, I really want Heidi slash Quinn to be an allegory for Trump. That's amazing. Did you, and you knew that when you began, and I'm always curious because I think novels can take such different paths. Like a novel with the same plot description that you just said could feel really, really different sort of texturally than yours. Um, did you understand what you were doing, that it was an allegory right away? Like as you, I think people are always interested in how a book comes into flower. What did it feel like? Well, you know, it, I remember Grace Paley saying one time, if you were a horse, you'd write as a horse. And so you always write from who you are and what you've lived and what you've written before. And so although I wanted to do something that was of the moment, a lot of my concerns that have really marked my work from the beginning, the relationships between women, what it is to be good, the, 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 the presence of malice and malice as a threat to goodness and the, the comparative fragility of goodness. But my hope at the end that even though it's not likely that goodness somehow survives. Um, and so I think that um, whatever you are, you write from who you were, who you are now, what you've read and um, and so they all kind of come together and it's hard to say, well, on Thursday I felt this and then Friday I felt this, but then by Sunday I felt this. It's, it's hard particularly, I don't know if you feel that, Meg, going back to remember how it all came together. You just suddenly- I know, it's like you had a seizure and you did this thing when you were unconscious and you don't remember right. doing it, I know. Because it's a lot of work. It's also, you know, the layers of allegory in this book are, are many because there, it's also an allegory about the planet. I mean, it really, yeah is about our abuse of the planet. And there is a sort of ecological component to the book as well. I wanted to really talk about our violence toward the planet and um, which, which terrifies me in a way more than anything. I mean, uh, just looking at the fires this week, um, I mean, we have enough terrible things happening, but our violence toward the planet and our, uh, which I really see as an act of violence, um, I wanted to make that a, a, a part of the plot and also a way in which revenge got acted out in a particularly terrible way. Do you think revenge, I'm thinking about the revenge enacted in this book, does revenge, can it heal a wound, do you think, for people? Or is no. that, it never can, right? No, it never can. It just, it digs the whole deeper and deeper it scrapes the wound deeper and deeper and it is as i said an appetite that can never never be satisfied but why do people go back to that well again and again because they've never seen a successful example of it anywhere i don't think well i mean it depends what you mean by success that um that it certainly feels like you're in control and i think what human beings hate more than anything else is feeling like they're out of control yeah. And if you are punishing, you are doing something. There's an act that has a reaction as opposed to you're just seeing yourself as a victim. And um, I think that, that to feel in control is one of the most important human impulses. And, and revenge makes you feel like they didn't get away with it. Um, we all have it. You know, I, I certainly have it um, about political leaders, about, um, uh, you know, about people who are mean to me in junior high school. I still really hope that, you know, that their lives were terrible and that- Mary, they're here tonight. Good, they're all of you. I hope your lives are all terrible if you were mean to me. Um, you know, I still remember somebody doing something to me in seventh grade and I still, if I saw that person, I would be really happy if she fell down on the street and broke her leg. Now, I like to think I would get up and help her, but there would still be that instant of libidinal joy right. that she had broken her leg, and even better if she had fallen in the mud and broken her leg and was filthy. So also, it seems to me one of the most 
terrible and mysterious human impulses is our desire to humiliate, which is very, very strong and very dark and mysterious to me. You know, um, Heidi, who becomes Quinn, I was thinking about your use of names because you and I are very interested in <laughs> language and on, on this sort of micro level, but the names are everything. First of all, Brimstone, which is Brimstone without the final E, um, and Heidi becoming Quinn Archer. I mean, just in terms of what you were just saying, if I may psychoanalyze it, if you were an angry person who was seeking revenge your whole life, wouldn't you name yourself a hard name like that? It's like a little anthracite, like a, a, like a Quinn and then Archer. She's just sort of going to sort of seek something out. I mean, I don't, I, I just love your use of names. Well, and then we have something that you and I share a lot, but we, we often have admitted that, um, you know, uh, one of the only reasons we write novels is to be able to make up names for characters and restaurants and movies and songs. I know my son accused me of that because I have an artisanal maple syrup company in my new novel called ASAP. And I think <laughs> I'm going to build the whole thing around it now. But, um, well, you know, and you say that we both like that, but I have to say, and I, I do want to bring this up particularly because of the subject of the book, because it's about a teacher and a student. We met um, because I was your student at Amherst College and uh, in a writing class and Final Payments was recently out and uh, it's a lifetime ago, but I think that the, um, the student-teacher mentor-protege relationship is endlessly interesting. Um, yeah, well, you've yeah. certainly written about that in the I've female I've written about it, yes, definitely. Um, because you said something to me once that, that really meant a lot to me when I was trying to figure out that novel, um, which is that a good mentor um, can't want anything from the protege, and she has yeah. to sort of step aside and let things unfold. Yes. So Agnes, as the mentor here, Agnes as a young teacher in 1972, teacher to Heidi, um, what does she see? What does she feel? What does she try to do? I mean, I, I always feel a little bit uh, mixed when I talk about a book that people haven't read because it literally just came out. So I feel like we have to talk in code so that people who've read it know what we're talking about and the people who haven't read it won't be bored. Um, what does she want when she tries to help her student? Well, one of the things uh, that is unfortunately part of being a teacher or a mentor is a certain amount of vanity that you really yeah. feel like you see something that nobody else sees. You can unleash something that nobody else can unleash. Right. And Heidi is very, very quick. She's very creative in, in a kind of dark way. And n none of the other teachers and none of the other students like her. So, uh, and, and Agnes also knows that her mother is just terrible, that, that Heidi's mother is terrible. So she wants to nurture her. She wants to... Um, guide her in ways that she thinks will be fulfilling, but um, she also wants uh, the particular ego gratification of being the one that mm -hmm. saw through her nastiness to the giftedness underneath. Right, right. Where can a relationship like that go? I feel like from the start, when there is an imbalance like that, something's going to shift in life and in art, right? Well, what happened to us? Yeah, I know, look at this, look at this. <laughs> so you all need to know that Meg is responsible for the birth of my grandchildren. Yes. Um, so God, what is it, 41 years, Meg? So um, my daughter babysat for Meg's children. And, when my, and, and Meg helped my daughter do her college essays. And now, I, you know, I'm going to sound like, uh, um, God, I've lost her name. What's the one that's in jail for? Oh, yeah. Him praying. Right. Anyway, so, but anyway, my daughter got on the waiting list at Yale, and she really wanted to go there. And I said, well, write a really good letter, and I'll call people, and you can, we'll try to get you off the waiting list. And my daughter said, I don't want you to do anything. I don't want any help from you, and I'm not going to write a letter. I want to go to Columbia. I did not listen to her. And so Meg's very dear friend was um, Jesse, Jesse Green, um, who is now the drama crit critic of, of, of the New York Times. And he, he was interviewing people for Yale. So I called him up. I said, Meg, can I call Jesse? Because he knew Anna because his kids were same age as, as 
Meg's kids. And I said, even if my daughter doesn't write a letter, can we go behind her back and try to get her off the waiting list? And he said, are you out of your mind? No. Anyway, Meg then knew that his partner's nephew was going to Columbia the same time that Anna was. And she said, tell Jesse that, you know, there's this really nice girl, Anna, uh, that he might like to know. So the first word that this young man, Michael, said to my daughter was, your mother tried to make my uncle get you off the waiting list at Yale. <laughs> and Anna said, that sounds like my mother. And that is my son-in-law and the father of my grandchildren. So I do think it, it goes back to Meg. But I do think, and I'm proud of us, you know, uh, yeah, you were my student, but you were such a gifted student. It was astonishing. But I, I feel like, um, we really listen to each other. I think we ask each other for advice. And I like to think that, you know, I mean, I think it was really good that you didn't listen to me and and write Last Payments, that book that I told you to write. I and know. It, it was good that you did create me in her image. And I said, no, I'm, I'm going to go out on my own. But, you know, <laughs> good luck to you, honey. Good luck. But we're... Where women, oh wait, can, I just want to say one thing. We did an event together many years ago at the Philadelphia Free Library and a man stood up during the Q&A. So nobody, please get in your questions. There are some questions. I, I, this is a great opportunity to say get in some questions. But I wanted to say, and I'm sure you remember this, a man stood up and said, you both look like normal women. Why do you write about sex and things like that? Like he just, you, you look Why normal. You write Why about you write about things down things? Why do you write about such down, down things? Why do you write something cheerful? But, but that leads me to actually ask you, why do you write? I mean, we know what reality TV gives people. It gives them a sort of curated, edited view of what they think other people are really living and it's aspirational and it's, it allows you to hate. Um, what does fiction give people? I think the reason why I think fiction and particularly novels are more important than ever is that um, fiction is the opposite of the tweet. And it always says that most things in the world are themselves, they're opposite and something in the middle simultaneously. And that's very difficult to bear. We really, really want something that is black and white, one thing or another, it's good or it's bad, we know what to do. But a great deal of life, not all of it, I'm not a total relativist, but a great deal of life is very, very complex and self-contradictory and having to kind of hack your way through that almost to what is a dependable kernel of truth. I think that's what, that's what novels do. And they, they create the habit of mind in people to do that, which is why I think they're very, very important and why I'm afraid they're going out of fashion a little bit. I don't, I don't think they're going out of fashion. Um, I, that's not my understanding. I think that, and, and it's sort of interesting to see what happens to reading habits during this, during a, a crisis and an ongoing crisis. I remember at the beginning of all of this, I was asked by NPR, what are you reading? And I, I sort of thought that I would settle in during the pandemic and read Willa Cather and things that I liked, that it would be an opportunity if you didn't have to go out of your apartment because your, you know, your job didn't endanger you to go out of your apartment and you were lucky enough to have a home to live in and, and you, know, you could pay your bills, that I would get a lot of reading done, but I wasn't able to do that. It, it touched my life in a big way. But uh, I wonder really about the solace of fiction. And you also said something once about um, when you feel that you can't read, um, or when things just seem so difficult, like during this, actually, we had this conversation during uh, the, the uh, 2016 election. How can you imagine a time of reading again? And you said, you need to think about the reading experiences of the past. And I've now written about this and talked about this because I think it's absolutely true from that conversation. I really got a lot out of it. Um, is that still true for you now? We're in a, at an inflection point in our Cool. Yeah, I mean, I think I actually, I mean, you, you, uh, you really, um, you know, your father died in, as a result of the uh, epidemic. So it's very different from you than for me. I've gotten a lot of work done. I set myself the task to read War and Peace, which I hadn't read since high school. And I think in high school, I only read the peace parts. Um, I actually read War and Peace. I've, I've gotten 
um, a lot of reading done. Um, right. Yeah, because I didn't have to run around so much, and and I wasn't te I wasn't teaching. Um, I'm now actually, as of June, retired, but um, but I actually have felt in many days that I would just go to older literature. What I haven't been reading is my contemporaries. I don't have a, an impulse to read my contemporaries, but I do have an impulse to read the great writers of the past and even even to reread. Just I, it's not a quid quo pro quo, but I find a great consolation in that richness of of of, of past writers that I, I loved. Too. But what about the impulse to uh, to write versus the impulse to read? The generative impu impulse is it. Um, is it how is it related to reading? Like when you want to write, is it at all connect? Is it at all similar? You know, when I start to write something, I I run around like a like a dog chasing a bone, looking for a literary model that will. Do you have start, one of your book? Yeah, well, I have a few stylistically. What's um, one? Well, the one that. Uh, so I, I looked at Willa Cather's uh, My Mortal Enemy um, a lot. I, I was looking a lot at Willa Cather, to tell you the truth. And because she can really do um, characters that you, that you like and, and, and characters that you hate. So I was really reading a lot of Willa Cather um, and trying to get, trying to, uh, and, and The Professor's House was another book that I was reading carefully of hers, trying to get plot in and without losing atmosphere, you, which I think she's so great at. Right. You mentioned uh, her writing characters that you like and characters that you don't dislike. Um, there's, a, you know, in Payback, certainly Heidi slash Quinn is a sort of concoction uh, a sort of like hard nut of a person, hellbent on revenge, unpleasant all along, but fascinating. Um, do you get leveled at you, that idea around likability that, that is leveled at certain women writers? Has that been appeared in criticisms of your work? Uh, oh yeah, I mean, you know, and particularly if you write one unpleasant thing about a male character, you know, you're considered a castrator and, and a vengeful, vengeful harpy. Um, I think that that people are very uncomfortable with um, not just female anger, but even female criticism. I just finished Elena Ferrante's new book, which I thought was drop dead brilliant. But and I'm I'm fascinated that the women in her books are they wake up in a rage, they have breakfast in a rage, they eat lunch in a rage, they have supper in a rage, and they go to bed in a rage. Um, and uh, but, uh, and I think it's very interesting that her audience is overwhelmingly female. I think that um, men, a lot of men that I know who are very good readers are made extremely uncomfortable by Elena Ferrante. Well, and, the Knausgaard books uh, and the Ferrante books sort of came out, became phenomena at, phenomenons at the same time, really, right? Um, yeah. Do you think that they, um, are seen as male and female in some basic or intrinsic ways? I think so. And, and I think that, you know, one of the things that always has annoyed me immensely is women feel they have to read the big male book and men don't tend to feel they have to read the big female book. So if one more man in, in an audience comes up and says to me, my wife reads your books. Yeah, I know. Right. Um, I just want to say, well, you know, what are you doing with your life that's so fabulous that you don't have time to read my book, that you don't, you just smile and say, well, I hope she likes it. How do you spell her name? Um, and, uh, uh, but I, I think that's something that, that really, really bothers me, that, that men don't feel like they have to read women, and women feel they have to read men to be respectable in the literary world. Right. Yeah, I mean, because the the voice of authority, the Walter Cronkite voice in people's heads is, is male, overwhelmingly yeah. male, right? Um, 
and we are living in a we are living in a moment where this loud obnoxious male voice is in our heads constantly too and we are trying to sort of exercise it when you read fiction i mean it's not does it does it teach you about tolerating pain or tolerating a difficult time in history can it actually do that or is that simply um it might be accidental that it does or incidental that it does that I, I never, um, I never make a one-to-one -one correspondence between between literature and life. I, I go to literature for an alternate life. Um, so you know, uh, among people who write, and this is what's painful: people who write the most wonderful moral books are often terrible people. I mean, uh, Willa Cather was was an anti-Semite. She was a, uh, she only likes like light-skinned immigrants or really educated Jews. That was okay. Henry James was, was a, a terrible, terrible anti, um, you know, white supremacist almost. Um, and Dostoevsky was a rip-roaring anti-Semite. Um, I don't expect that there's a one-to-one -one correlation and I don't look to books for how to live. I look to books for an alternate life, which in some way that is not one-to-one -one and I can't express deepens my life. But I don't think that people who read novels are better than people who don't read novels. If they were, English departments would be little paradises on earth, and they're not. Um, and some of the most wonderful people I know, you know, would think that, uh, Jacqueline Suzanne was Proust. And uh, some of the people who can read Proust brilliantly are just dreadful human beings. So I wish there, I really wish there were a cor correlation, but I don't think it is. It's very mysterious. It's why it's hard to defend, but I couldn't live without it. Same, and, but I also feel, and maybe you do too, that when you meet someone who loves a book that, particularly if it's a book that, that people don't know generally, but if they love it the way you do, you feel like I will marry you. I will, yeah. I want to live with you. It doesn't, right. I mean, I want to exactly. talk to you forever. And that's a funny thing because it's like, it is, it is spoken to us. It's yeah. like the mermaids singing each two. There's some weird way that we feel so relieved to be, I mean, I think people spend a lot of their lives trying to be mysterious, like when you're young and you're beret wearing, cigarette smoking phase, and we have a few photos of you in that era. But, uh, it was a good look, come on. It was a really good look. Um, but I think the desire to be known, I mean, there's a, there's a tension between the desire to be hidden and the desire to be known. And I think- I think that the problem with, with, with your thesis though is that you, what do you do if after you find out that um you know the person that you just met who who really likes Catherine Ann Porter Nazi? what is, is is first of all really boring um I know. well that not just a Nazi but after you talk about this book and they want to hang out with you and you find yourself saying that you're or actually forcing yourself to move to New Zealand to get away from them um you're right. It's, 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 a, it's a moment, a but, it, but doesn't no, it carry, doesn't, again, it doesn't carry through to life, unfortunately. No, it doesn't carry through to life, but I think it's an acknowledgement. And I, for me, it's, it's about a cessation of loneliness in some way, that there is a moment when you understand that out there, there are these points of light that people love, mm -hmm. are moved by something, and they can't even explain why. I yeah. think there's a grace in that. Yes, it's a grace and, and it's it's a moment. And sometimes when life is very dark, those little moments shimmer in a way that in a way that they don't in, yeah. in other ways. I know. I mean I mean do you is so your reading in this period has been uh, voluminous and full because I find that since the internet I mean we when we started writing novels, we wrote them on typewriters or by hand, as you do. I do. Um, you, and which is just amazing to me. And uh, I remember yeah, one of the most thrilling things that happened to me today was I ordered a notebook from a European notebook maker and it came in the mail and I just thought, okay, my life is good now. I have a new beautiful notebook because I'm very addicted to notebooks and pens because I do write by hand. 
I feel like when I started writing novels, I, I wrote on a little royal typewriter and I used whiteout. And it was sort of like doing scrimshaw. It was like you were so, you were doing a craft. You were like knitting your novel. I cannot believe that we, you know, did that or that I did that and, every, and many people I knew did that. It took so long, but, it, but there was a way I think that we, we got, cl you're closer to the page in some sense in having to write it out. Aren't you? Yeah, and I, and I feel like there's a, a physical rhythm. My body is part of the process. And, you know, I, oh, I, if I'm writing something and um, it takes me a long time and even my hand gets a little bit tired, that's telling me something. Um, and, you know, I'm just, you know, I'm, I'm the <clears throat> anti-tech girl. Um, but I, there's something about that slowness that is, is congenial to me. And for other people, I remember somebody saying, oh no, I think using a computer is like writing with light. She, she thought that it was kind of mystical, but I, I like the slowness. Um, and well, the slowness seems to run counter to the prevailing speed um, of which our, at which our lives run. And we're always trying to sort of stop that and slow it down. Um, the 24 hour news cycle, the novel is, as you say, the opposite of the tweet. It's also sort of the opposite of the 24 hour news cycle. The notion of what happens in, in fiction, it, it should be able to be read as you're reading Willa Cather, you know, how many years after she wrote those books? Um, yeah. Uh, and that it must feel, I, I think fresh is actually a decent word. Um, One of the things that astonished me to think about as a numbers thing is I read Mrs. Dalloway for the first time in 1969 and more years have passed between then and this moment than passed between when Mrs. When Virginia Woolf wrote Mrs. Dalloway and I first read it. And that just kind of blew my mind uh, that uh, in a way I'm so close to her, but in a way I'm so far away from her and how, you know, how my life has, has blended in and out with that writing. And so 1923 seems like, you know, another planet, another solar system, but Mrs. Dalloway seems like, you know, she's sitting next to me. Maybe that's, we're getting at what books do, really. Um, they provide proximity in some sense. Yes. And I think that that is what we look for. That's what yeah. we do and what we look for. And I don't know that the same is exactly true for other uh, mediums, right? Is it? Well, I, you know, both of us are very um, committed to visual arts. And I think that standing still in front of a painting that can slow things down too. Um, and music is different because it's through time. Right. And, um, and it's very interesting because when, 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 for me, when I try to learn a piece of music, I'm not that musically gifted, but I have to listen to it so many times before I'm familiar with it. And so that's a different kind of slowing down. That's but right. the fact that music goes through time so quickly, and if you miss it, you miss it, and you can't go back to it. Right, I know. That, that makes it very, very different. Yeah, being the master of your speed and, and going back to a paragraph and finding it. And one of the things that I love about a book as opposed to something on a device is that when you're looking for a sentence, it's hard to find it. Yeah. It's hard to find it, and you go on this sort of, you navigate a path and then you almost forget like being at the supermarket and buying something at the counter and forgetting what you went there for. You may forget the sentence you were looking yeah. at and you find the beauty of other ones. Yes, yes, it's, so it's a great thing. It's a great, great thing and we all recommend it, but I think everybody here must be a big fiction reader um, and knows Mary's work well. Uh, we have a bunch of questions, so I think maybe this is a good time to take uh, some of the questions, so let me look. Okay. Oh, here's one that I think you'll like from Kathleen Werner. Mary Kathleen Kate, Mary my Kate loved yeah. your book. Amazing to see you after our years together at Holy Name of Mary. She was in my class. She was very smart. She's we here. did projects together. Do you want we to say something to Kathleen? We made a volcano together at your house, Kathy. I remember that. You were very smart. We she, liked to read books. She says, I hope I was never mean to you 
too funny, but I shattered my legs in a car accident. Oh no, but not, not because not because of Mary. Um, okay, uh, let's see. Oh, somebody says, F, about all I have done in the last seven months is, this is Patricia, is read and Zoom author events and spend a lot of money on books from indie bookstores. I am so grateful for novels, which is, I think we are too, absolutely. Yes. Um, uh, oh, brilliant conversation, says Patricia. Uh, That's obviously a brilliant person. Oh, wait, Helen Deutsch is here. Lori, Lori Laughlin. Oh, that's the name. I was like saying, why is, who is that name? Is that a novelist? Is that an author of Villanelles? No, it's some woman from some TV show who's in jail now for help trying to get her kid into college. Right, so, like I tried to get my daughter into Yale, but she wouldn't let you, me. Unlike Lori Laughlin, thank you. Helen, who was in that same yeah, writing class. Yes. Oh my God, and, and it's been a long time, but nice to see you again. Um, unlike Lori Laughlin, you did not make your daughter pose on a rowing machine so that it looked like she was on the crew <laughs> and then like put her into like a photo of a, of a boat. Yes, I did. Mary, I don't think you should be saying this to people. Oh, oh. You have a literary reputation to uphold, oh. and I think oh. it's really kind of important that you do. Oh, um, jeepers. Uh, I know. Now, um, so those are, oh, is that, a, you must have more questions. Oh, wait, Q&A. Oh, um, oh, here's a question also from Kathleen, aka Kathy, Volcano Girl. I was crying as I read, and she was crying because she could not stop time. When you are writing, do your own emotions react to the words, or are the words your emotions? No, I often do feel very, very sad, even tearful when I'm writing. Yes. In yeah. this book, what, um, what was the, the central emotion for you? Um, I think that I, the central emotion was Agnes's anguish that she had just through carelessness um, ruined somebody's life and, and, and her sense that she could never atone for that. The anguish that, that came to her for that was the strongest emotion. Did you, when you finish a book, and then I've got another question here, but I'm curious. So if you're feeling anguish and you're going through a sort of range of feelings that are deep and difficult, when the book is done, uh, what happens emotionally? They're gone. They're dead to no, you? They're, they're dead. It's so, terrible. They're like, Kevya looking at his daughter. <laughs> just you did. Right. I just, you know, I'm on to the next thing. It's it's sort of awful. I can't imagine doing a sequel. I you cannot can't. imagine doing a sequel to anything I've written. Really? No. Yeah. Um even for a lot of money? Well <laughs> No, I really couldn't. But do you ever find yourself being interviewed and somebody asks you a question about an earlier book and you don't know? what they're talking about or who these people are. They say, yes, when yes. Samuel, in that moment, when Samuel meets Melissa and they're outside the herring shop, what was it that he said to her? He said, like, oh, oh my God, I love herring. I love herring, the end. Yeah, that was your, perhaps your most least Catholic book, I would say. It was called one. The Herring Maven. Oh, but you know, I know you don't want to do a sequel to The Herring Maven, but I think the world is crying out for it right oh, now. Okay, all right, I might do that. I In might do that. Times, we need a little laughter and we need a little herring, okay? Yes. Um, Ilana is saying, hi, uh, Ilana Blumberg. Hi, Mary dear. What is it like to write knowing you have grandchildren in the world? Um, Ilana is another old student living in Israel at the moment, actually. I, um, I have a lot of terror and despair knowing that I have grandchildren in the world who are the, the single most important thing and the most dear to me. Um, you know, that these fires, what we've done to the planet, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm terrified for them. I, al I almost feel like, what does my writing have to do with I'll, I'll never be able to help them. My only problem is it's the only thing I, I can, although my grandson did once ask me if I was famous for anything besides fried chicken. Um, I am very good at making fried chicken for the boys. But um, I, I remember in, 
in the Gospels, when Jesus is going up to Calvary, the women are weeping for him. And he says, don't, don't weep for me. Weep for yourselves. The time will come when people will say, blessed are the wombs that never bore. And um, it's, it's the greatest joy in the world to have grandchildren. But my fear for the planet and the state of the world um, is, is exacerbated by having these marvelous divine grandchildren but i think anyone who has children feels that yeah yeah um peter smith our mutual dear friend writes how wonderful to see your face and mary and meg's face do you write for now or a year from now given publishing schedules or is the hope always that it will be read 50 years from now 100 years and will manage to transcend its time like mrs galloway in short do you approach a novel as an of its moment art form no never and i also I feel like one of the temptations that I have to avoid is to fantasize or think about what the response of a novel will be now, tomorrow, 10 days from now. I mean, I, I, ha I, have to, I have to kind of work on the discipline not to think about that. I can only do what I did. And the rest of it is absolutely not my business. And only it, it's only diminishing to me as, as yeah. a soul. No, I agree, I agree. So Helen Deutsch is asking us a question. It is wonderful to see you both. Mary, you said in an earlier interview that you believe that Agnes is in fact responsible for ruining Heidi's life. I'm not done with the book yet, so don't give away the big car crash snake bite scene. I'm halfway through and loving it, but do you think atonement is possible? Or maybe I'm asking, is this a Catholic book? Great question. Is atonement, uh, I'm very interested in atonement and Agnes is very interested in atonement. Uh, so atonement seems to me something that, is, that has two aspects to it. It's the relief of one's own guilt. And then can you do something that actually changes the life that you damaged in a positive way? Um, and I think it's easier to do the second than the first. Sometimes you might be able to, that's, that's what Heidi's show is based on. But um, it's very, very hard, almost impossible, I think, to ever let go of the feeling that you've harmed someone. Yeah, yeah. Um, you, you tend to obsess, you, I mean, I, do you sort of perseverate in your life? And if so, does that appear in your book, like in your books? Would you say that there is like a, a series of ticks, in a sense, over, over your body of work? So somebody who once told me why they could ne nobody could ever make a film of any of my books is that she says, your books are always about the effect of the past on the present. And so you would always need two actresses. Yeah. You would always need two scenes. And I think, yeah, I think if there's a tick, that's my tick. The, the effect of the past on the present, the relationship of the past to the present. I once went around actually in a group of writers, I don't know how this came about, and everybody had to, people were, everybody knew one another's work pretty well. And people were trying to decide like exactly that question about the different writers. Like what was it that was a sort of a theme that was sort of appearing that the, you know, th sort of like, coming into focus in a chemical bath that the writer maybe didn't even necessarily know. And it was a really interesting thing to sort of, to do. It's an interesting game to play. Um, what do you think yours is? Well, it was what they thought. And I actually don't disagree with it. I don't think I would have come up with it. But one of the things was the dynamic of the group. And they, they looked at the group as it could even be sort of dyadic. It could be a husband and wife in my book, The Wife or the mentor, that it was really uh, in the interestings that it is a group of friends who come of age and meet at a summer camp and it follows them over time. But that my interest was the structural interest in a marriage, in like the pas de, you know, the pas de deux that, that happens. Um, and I thought that was pretty interesting. I mean, I, I, I don't know that in either case it's the only thing, but yeah. I, I, I think it is one thing that emerges. And I, and I don't know that those things are things that you can necessarily see that easily in yourself. Yeah. yeah. You need somebody else to tell you, I can't make your movie because of this or, yeah. you know. Um, okay. So here's a question from Caitlin. Wonderful conversation. Thank you. So lovely to see you, Mary. Do the two of you ever read drafts of each other's books? Yes. Yes. 
Yes. <laughs> and it's not only that, but you get read to. It's so great. <laughs> Be friends with this person. You know, honestly, be fr- although I joke with my friends that if you wait long enough, you can be friends with anybody. It's sort of like, you know, just you can be friends with Mary. You can be friends with me. The, the, your wait has ended and you can read us. Your, no, we, we read to each other. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, yeah. And we send each other things. And yeah. I'm like, all I the time. I think it's great because we both preserve a certain uh, level for our editors. Like we don't, we're not, our editors are wonderful and we are both very, very lucky. lucky to have really serious literary editors. Yeah, really line readers, lovers of language, Deborah Garrison and, and Sarah McGrath um, at different publishing houses. And, and yet I know that every time my editor reads something, um, the next time she reads it, it, it's never going to be the first time, right? Yeah. yeah. So I use you. Yeah. Yeah, right? You use me. You use me. I use you, and I think it's tonight is when we're revealing that, really. <laughs> that this whole thing has just been about using you. Um, okay, Kathy is saying, Mary Kate, and I'm really enjoying this, I have to say, calling you Mary Kate. I look forward to traveling back in time to see you. I have good memories of you and your mom. I, too, am a grateful grandmother, and my legs are still walking. <laughs> Be well. Um, that's making me think about traveling back in time, and is the novel about time. Margaret Atwood once said, and and she was sort of half being piquant really, that uh, the novel is about time and the poem is about eternity. Um, But you're looking, you know, I I, I thought it was interesting. I thought it was interesting. I thought it was really interesting because the poem tries to capture something that stands in for so much more. The, the novel, the realistic novel, and I think actually we should just sort of say as we sort of wind this down a little bit, we both are very interested in realism, in, yeah. uh, in novels that, I mean, I have done some things that are sort of surprising and you have to, sometimes it's more about where the novel will go. I mean, uh-huh. Chekhov could suddenly go into the point of view of a dog, but um, what is the power of the social novel, the realist novel, what is its power for us? What is its draw? Well, it's interesting because when you think about like some writers that I just can't read because they're too realistic, like I'm thinking of people like Upton Sinclair or even Dreiser, um, there has to be, for me, which is why I, I, I quarrel with Margaret a little bit, there has to be, um, for me, an infusion of poetry in the novel. And so the novels that I love are speaking about both time and eternity. And if it's, if they're just of the moment, if it's just kind of, um, kind of uh, getting down where we are now, I'm not that interested. I, I need um, a bath, an infusion, an injection of the eternal, and I, and I certainly need an injection of the poetic. I began as poet. I didn't know I was going to be a prose writer until I, I was actually in my mid-20s and I had finished graduate school. Um, so again, partly what she says is right, but I also feel there's more, um, the short story and the poem almost have more in common than the, than the novel. I'm right about that quote. I, I'm not certain I am, but, if, but I think, and I, and I don't know if she was sort of partly, you know, being jokey ab- about it, but, but I don't even think it's necessarily that one in, that a writer infuses a novel with eternity. I feel that it happens when you start exploring what you, what matters. That's right. You, then it happens. You said something that has been a real guiding force for me in that writing class. Um, you said, uh, only write what's important. And what you meant is only write what's important to you. And I right. think it's great advice to give a young writer or an old writer. Um, I, I really do, because there are a lot of things that are good subjects for books. Right. They're just not my subject. That's right. And we have, uh, we've all been beset by people who have an idea for us, uh, for a book, right? But of course, it's their book. It's not yes. your book. It's yeah. their book. And... And I also think that people who say, oh, you know, you should write a novel about, I don't know, uh, 
global warming or something. I, I couldn't do that. I couldn't have, um, you know, a, a made to order or for the moment thing. So for me, a lot of, a lot of importances have to come together. And it's that, it's that, um, that melding of textures. And I guess it is one's particular obsessions that again, give weight to what is important to you. And so that's where the, I guess the eternity enters. That's um, right. It sneaks in. It's there. Yeah. Um, a few more questions. Uh, thanks for this wonderful conversation. Mary, uh, this is from an anonymous attendee. I'm wondering whether you could talk about the importance to you of American female authors that like Willa Cather should be canonical, but aren't. Yes, this is one of my absolute talk about obsessions. Um, Willa Cather, of course, Catherine Ann Porter, great, great writer that isn't read enough. Eudora Welty, Jean Stafford, brilliant, brilliant writer. Um, Tilly Olson, who was really important to people of, of my generation and your cohort. Nobody reads her anymore. It's amazing um, who laughs and who doesn't, right? People, yeah, yeah. So uh, I feel like there's a whole other tradition in American writers that, and people don't read them. And so I, I'll always go in to my students and say, have you ever read Catherine and Porter? They say no, and I give them Pale Horse, Pale Rider to read and they jump out of their skins. Particularly and, now, I would think, right? Yeah, and um, you know, I, I, I'll give them Jean Stafford's story about a nose operation called the Interior Castle, which is, totally brilliant about pain and the body and the mind and the spirit nobody no, you know nobody would have read her anymore and they just keep reading the same few you know Hemingway who as I said I like blaming for everything including global warming I, I really feel like he put his heavy muddy boot on the face of American prose and he flattened it. So for example, he wrote to Edmund Wilson about uh, this book that I was just reading of Willa Cather's called One of Ours, which is brilliant. And he said, oh, you know, it's all about women. Let's try to avoid the catheterization of American fiction. So and, and these guys deliberately um, sidelined these women. And, um, and also a lot of them wrote in shorter forms. And so again, you know, the bigger is better, which I think is, you know, we can talk about that. Um, that has really flattened the face of American prose yeah. in a way that I think is very unfortunate. But everybody needs to read Catherine Ann Porter. Yes, absolutely. Yes. And people, I think people are talking about Pale Horse, Pale Rider yeah. these days. And then another absolutely fabulous story of hers called Holiday, which if anybody I don't know is it. interested in disability, it's just astonishing um we have to stop in a minute but i'm going to just get to these quick little questions so maybe give this is the lightning round okay okay you just give short answers i haven't read your book says yvette but if i may ask once you finish writing do you feel relieved do you care if others read it do you hope for a lot of feedback and dialogue about it and does it disturb you if readers pull you out of your book pull out of your book something that you hadn't intended yes 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 and yes <laughs> yes to everything you're completely right yeah, okay, great. And Hannah says, when you are writing a book, do you have an idea as to where you want the story to go or end? Or do you write, do you let it lead you? Do you write more as it comes to you, she says. Well, both. I, I'm not a hopeful enough person that I can begin a novel without thinking I know where it ends, but I am often wrong. And so I allow myself to be wrong and to change. Did this book end uh, where you imagined that it would? No, not at all. Really? Okay. Well, yeah. don't tell us where you were going to have it end. Okay. I think we need to stop at six o'clock. This flew by. I love talking to you. It's uh, wonderful. But we talk. We talk all yeah. the time. Really, almost we should every be day. I know, almost every day. It's wonderful. So please buy, uh, you can purchase uh, Mary's book. There's a note uh, in the chat uh, from Politics and Prose, which is, by the way, one of my favorite bookstores. And it's I'm so wonderful. So we love it so much, and we've loved it for years, and you're doing God's work. You really are. Please support this bookstore, all indie bookstores. Uh, fiction matters, and we're going to get through this. So, And read Mary's book in the short run, because it's really wonderful. It's just her best, and congratulations, Mary. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Bye, everybody. Bye-bye. Thanks for coming.